So we have uh, uh, Rich Levitan uh, today, which is kind of a, 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 not kind of, it's a special treat for us. Uh, Rich is uh, a New Yorker. He's supposed to be living in New York, and life has taken him on a, on a journey outside of New York, but sooner or later he'll make his way back. But he's an innovator in our specialty, and with our visiting professor uh, uh, series, what we try and do is bring in innovators, because they're the role models for all of us, to think out of the box of how to make things better. So when you think of people who've changed the practice of emergency medicine, I think Rich comes forward because he thought out of the box about how we practice uh, airway management, what's the role of the emergency physician in airway, and how do we become better clinicians and provide better care for our patients. So in the, in the 90s, uh, he really hit the scene with his uh, innovation, the the uh, cam device that was on strapped to the head and you could actually watch what a resident or, or any practitioner was doing as, as they uh, intubated. And then the lessons that were learned from that were, were um, integrated into new devices. And he's had an extremely uh, uh, impactful career uh, ever since then. So it's really a, a pleasure to have him with us. He trained at Bellevue, if I remember correctly, and then he spent some time at Lincoln and uh, survived there two years and made his way then to the to, uh, University of Pennsylvania. And he survived there. And then he made his way to Jefferson, where he is now. And I've probably left some part out. Uh, he's also now doing some other work. And of course, uh, I think most of you are familiar with his national courses and international uh, courses that are done to teach airway management. So it's really, it's really an honor and it's a pleasure to have him here and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing his talk. Well, that's a very generous introduction. Um, my interest in airway management began out of fear. There wasn't much more intimidating and actually it's funny to bring back uh, Jeff Levine is here. And, uh, anyway, when I was at Bellevue uh, <laughs> a long time ago, we had uh, pushing matches over uh, who managed the airway. And in fact, we didn't even have muscle relaxants when I started, so we would give lots of Valium, sometimes ketamine, wrestle with the patient, wrestle with the surgeons, bump out the anesthesiologist to manage the airway. Uh, it was an ugly scene, and I got obsessed with airway management because honestly, it scared the bejeebers out of me. When the meds went in, everybody stopped and looked at you to drop this tube. And um, anyway, I ended up running at this uh, procedural challenge, and so I've spent much of the last 20 years kind of singularly focused on airway stuff. For the last 10, every month in Baltimore, I run the world's largest fresh tissue cadaver lab. So I have 18 cadavers every month that are venous drained, arterially flushed, specially prepared, and we do all kinds of advanced imaging, bronchoscopy, fiber optics, direct surgical airways. And over the years, I've gotten to play with a lot of devices and things. Um, and what's striking to me, actually, and I'm at Jefferson now, and for those of you who don't know, Jefferson is uh, I think it was founded in the 1820s, but the first professor of laryngology at Jefferson was a guy named J. Silas Cohen, who traveled to England, brought back the techniques of a guy named Morel McKenzie. And then the second chair of laryngology was a guy named Chevalier Jackson, who was one of the founders of ear, nose, and throat surgery in the United States. And I've gotten interested in the history of laryngoscopy, and a lot of what I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you some pictures of uh, old, direct, and other stuff. Um, but, and we're going to talk about anatomy. I have uh, some pictures here starting of uh, fractals. Is there any way to kill the lights up front? I think it would be better for the video, but I don't know, maybe not. Yeah, I mean, you've got a pretty good image. Uh, but I think the interesting thing about fractals are that, uh, and for those of you not familiar with the Mandelbrot set, uh, you know, mathematics, fractal mathematics now affords a way to look at complex things in nature. And, and derive these patterns that seemingly were unexplainable. And I think when it comes to the airway, there's some really critical but incredibly simple uh, concepts. So I no longer do intubation. I do epiglottoscopy followed by laryngoscopy followed by tube delivery. It doesn't matter what device it is. So if I'm picking up a glottoscope or direct laryngoscope, I'm not exposing the larynx, I'm finding the epiglottis then exposing the larynx, then delivering the tube. Uh, we're going to talk about positioning by manual. Apneic oxygenation, I was out last night 
with Dr. Jagoda and uh, Scott Weingart, and I think you guys are already on the cutting edge of this, uh, courtesy of Scott's involvement, but it's an ironic thing that historically, and those of you just started may not appreciate this, but historically, the way we approached the airway in terms of oxygen was, we gave plenty of oxygen, as much as we could before we put the tube in. We would then render them apneic. We take all the oxygen off, and then we try to put the tube in, and then we band them up to get the oxygen back up because to make up for the time period when the oxygen wasn't on. And now, uh, I think it will become standard. And I, I, are you guys doing this routinely now? You run oxygen on every airway. Um, it takes out all the fun. In the days of the giants, you know, we would watch the pulse ox fall. We'd turn to the resident and go, come on, get one chance. The pulse ox is falling. And then it was this whole dynamic of, you know, what would happen. And nowadays, my last, in the last year that I've started doing this, and I wrote up this paper I call No DSAT, Nasal Oxygen During Efforts Securing the Tube. But I wrote up this paper. In the last year that I've done that, my experience with RSI is pulse ox goes up. And uh, it's a pretty neat thing. But uh, let's talk about epiglottoscopy. To me, the secret of the airway can be reduced to one word. It's the epiglottis. The epiglottis is halfway from where we start to where we're going. It's midway between right and left. It's literally the center of the cross, and that's ironic coming from a Jewish guy lecturing at Sinai. But uh, it's, it's amazing. Here we have the top of the epiglottis. Here's the areopiglottic fold coming down on either side to the posterior cartilages. So this is in uh, my cadaver lab, but one of the you know the things that I think novice <laughs> intubators don't appreciate is just how high up the epiglottis is relative to the other structures of the larynx. So when we come down the tongue, the first goal is to find this and then to expose that. And it's only last and deepest, farthest within the larynx that we actually get to the vocal cords. Here we have the cricoid, large in the back, narrow in the front, the incomplete tracheal rings. And this image, which is what I was taught, you know, gives you the false impression that everything is on the same level, and obviously it isn't. But uh, I think that the key is epiglottoscopy. And it, if you go back and you look, 1895, Kirstein, the first reported direct laryngoscopy, Kirsten talks about that the tip of the otoscope, and he called it autoscopy, their version of laryngoscopy was with a mirror. So when he started directly exposing the larynx, he called it an autoscope and autoscopy. But he talks about, you know, the error that novices make is that they go too deep, and that is still the error today. So unfortunately, in our specialty, some people teach this idea that you should take laryngoscopes, plunge in, back out. I never do that. I do very progressive visualization of the epiglottis. In 1912, Bruning's talked about the stages of laryngoscopy. Jackson considered exposure and identification of the epiglottis stage one. And so whether I'm using a flexible fibroscope, DL, or glidescope, to me, I agree with Jackson that the epiglottis must always be identified before any attempt is made to expose the larynx. So our images here, we see the curl epiglottis edge, and then the next structure we're gonna get are the posterior cartilages and notch and we get a little bit of the glottic opening there, and then the cords come last. And so what you notice in this image is that the posterior aspect of larynx, you don't see the cords. And I think we have to, as Jackson said, train the eyes and train the hands. But I think we have to burn it into our visual cortex. And nowadays, we have plenty of ways to do this. Um, this is an MRI image which talks about just sort of this unique positioning in the box. We have the curvature of the spine coming down. We have the mass of tongue here. So this is a three pound uh, you know, piece of tissue, if you look at the tongue and the mandible. So the whole goal of the initial phase of laryngoscopy, and I would argue with video as well, is simply to distract this. What is, I think, underappreciated is that when you crank your head back, you actually push the base of the epiglottis or the base of the tongue and the epiglottis against the posterior pharynx. Somehow, I think it's the AHA that did this, the notion that you should tilt the head back for airway management comes from that. But look at patients. How do people come into emergency departments in respiratory distress? The head comes forward. When you watch runners at the end of uh, New York City Marathon, on um, the west side of uh, New York, um, and I remember actually, I think the last time I was close in this vicinity may have been, Oh, one, anyway, when I was running a marathon and I was having a conversation with my long deceased mother, uh, it was kind of bizarre, but I remember this uh, <laughs> conversation I had. But you know, you watch runners at the end of 
a race and their head is forward and they're gone. And you know, they bring their head forward. Somewhere along the way, we started doing this. And if you crank your head back, try taking a breath, it becomes striders. You know, you go <laughs> up like this and you get strider. Conversely, with your head forward, you can't create it. But <clears throat> I think the key thing is to appreciate that the intersection of this mass of tissue that we are distracting anteriorly and the curvature of the spine, which goes down into the thorax and the tracheal access follows it. Um, the epiglottis is at that junction. <laughs> and the inclination of the trachea is actually very important because when we're using video laryngoscopes and even direct, we come up to look at the larynx and then the tube has to go down into the trachea, which means you're gonna have contact with the tracheal rings. And we'll talk more about that, but this is particularly an issue when it comes to using video laryngoscopes. And are you guys using Live scope, storts, which toys do you guys have? You have all the above. Um, but uh, so here we have the trace profile of a head, and this is some wonderful work out of the UC system where they track the movements of a laryngoscope in two dimensional space. And what these people found was that novices go in and out and in and out, and they basically 109 centimeters and 36 seconds to expose the larynx. In the same patient, the expert laryngoscopist does a very methodical tick, 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 down the tongue, there's the epiglottis, minor adjustment. So I believe that novices do epiglottoscopy, and they get to the larynx in half the distance and one-third the time. And this is particularly important in pediatrics. In pediatrics, you know, basically about half the time in neonates, the uvula is touching the epiglottis. So you go in and you're more than, you know, an inch, you're past the epiglottis. And I think that the error that most novices make is they simply overrun all landmarks. They get into pink mush and then they go, it's a difficult airway because they miss the on-ramp to the larynx, namely the epiglottis. The other unique thing about the epiglottis, and this is true in video as well as in direct, is that the epiglottis is going to sort of be laying on the posterior pharyngeal wall in a bath of <coughs> saliva or blood or vomit. So when the airway gets difficult and you can't find the epiglottis or you can't find the larynx, the only structure that you can elevate anteriorly out of the muck is the epiglottis. Everything else is going to be swimming. So I have the anchor on the right. I go down very methodically, dab, dab, dab. Where's the epiglottis? Whether that's with the glide scope or direct, I want to find the epiglottis. So uh, here's just some imaging of this using my camera system from the cadaver lab. But, uh, you know, the epiglottis has this habit of morphing into the posterior pharyngeal wall. One minute you don't see it, and then you can elevate it off, and, you know, we're going to get some of the posterior cartilages there, a little bit of the larynx. But I think that the, you know, this phenomenon of epiglottis camouflage uh, happens quite a bit. Here's some imaging from the original glidescope, black and white, and... Uh, that, that wasn't that long ago. It seems like I'm saying something that happened in the 60s, but no, this was uh, 10 years ago. But the glidescope basically, um, here we have, by the way, the airy uh, epiglottic fold. This is the pharyngo epiglottic fold coming up there. Um, but notice where the epiglottis sits when we start. The epiglottis is sitting against the posterior pharyngeal wall. It is the first structure that we, you know, distract upward. And then we have the AE fold that looks like you know, almost a, a hood projecting over the rest of the larynx. And the back of the larynx is that dark hole with the cords anterior and these posterior structures, which I already commented on. So let's talk about bimanual laryngoscopy. Johann Zermark, who had the gift of being able to self-mirror laryngoscopy himself. So he, he, he basically stood in front of mirrors and figured out a contraption so he could give presentations on human voice. So imagine in the 1800s, nobody's ever seen a larynx, and he was able to take these mirrors and project his image of his larynx uh, in an auditorium. And uh, it, he was quite the hit. But what I think is funny is that you have all these different drawings of Zermark, and he looks the same. Um, but what is he doing with his left hand? So remember, Selleck and the Selleck Maneuver, 1961. So 103 years after okay. these images. Um, so Zermark is holding his hand 
not on the cricoid, but on the thyroid. So what the early pioneers of laryngoscopy knew is that the larynx is a mobile structure and <coughs> posteriorly displace the larynx to expose it. So I, I like also, and you can see here, he's biting on a rod that holds the mirror. So the sunlight comes through the open window, reflects it off his head mirror down to a second mirror, and then he pushes the larynx posteriorly with the thyroid. Uh, this was before they came up with the head strap for the mirror. But uh, <laughs> So let's take a look at Kirstein, uh, 19, uh, 1895 or 1897 by the time the English version came along. Kirstein describes pressure applied with the thumb upon the middle of thyroid cartilage, you know, will, can considerably enlarge the view, especially in the young. By means of this manipulation, the anterior commissure can be brought into view. The reason why the early pioneers of laryngoscopy needed to see the anterior commissure is that's where a lot of the pathology is. So for our purposes, all we need is a hint of a notch in the posterior cartilages, but they were very interested in this. Um, here is a wonderful picture of Bruning's counterpressor attachment. I like the pinky model there, you know, he's sitting there tweaking this with his little pinky. Um, but Bruning's, uh, you know, they hadn't yet figured out that this exaggerated manto-occipital extension, which they came to by studying sword swallowers, um, that this is not the position you want. But uh, again, this was in 1910. Um, in 1909, a fellow by the name of Richard Johnston in Baltimore, actually a few blocks from where I give my cadaver course, 830 North Charles, first described lifting the head higher to improve laryngeal exposure, and we'll get to that. But Bruning's, you know, also appreciated the value of bimanual laryngoscopy. Selleck comes along in 1961, and this became lore. And for many years, we have taught that cricoid pressure was the linchpin of safety in emergency airway management. Are you guys still doing cricoid? God, beautiful thing. So I've been advocating this for a decade. In 2011, the ACLS guidelines just changed. And the irony of this is we had this very misguided anatomic notion that we could compress the esophagus by pressing on the cricoid. And it seemed to make sense, and that's why it was kind of this sticky notion and it caught on. By the way, uh, Selleck's original photo does not include the Fig Newtons, but they are heavy cookies. And for those of you who know, you know, you're supposed to do 44 Newtons, uh, which is about 10 pounds. But, um, you know, Selleck said extreme atlanto-occipital extension, head lower than the chest. So, you know, there was actually a uh, obstetrician here who first, Mendelssohn, who first described uh, this whole business of uh, well, in anesthesiology and obstetrics, it was out of Sinai. Aspiration syndrome was first uh, described, but they were using incredible volumes of air. So everybody vomited. And because everybody vomited, they actually suggested that you uh, hold the patient's head down so the vomit could run out. Imagine trying to ventilate people in a head down position, but that's what they recommended. And extreme atlanto-occipital extension, which actually doesn't uh, open the airway. What's interesting is now with modern imaging, we know that airway compression with cricoid pressure occurs 81% of the time, and in 90% of the time, the esophagus actually moves lateral to the cricoid. And a picture's worth a thousand words, but here we have the cricoid ring, here we have the esophagus, this is the vertebral body. Pressure is applied here, and look what happens, the esophagus moves to the side. So although this was a very sticky concept that for many years was deemed to be the linchpin of safety. We now look back on it and go, yeah, that was stupid. And I can be at a Grand Rounds at a major academic center, and I can say, do you guys do cricoid pressure? And you're like, nah. I can tell you, five years ago, I went to Yale, and I suggested this concept. And the chairman, after my talk, said, I just want to make a formal announcement that we're still doing cricoid pressure. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you know, they're late to the game anyway. But uh, no, but it, it's just sort of a fascinating thing how if you stay around in emergency medicine, a lot of what you were taught as religious and you have to do this, wait 10 years, wait 20 years, you look back, yeah, that was stupid, don't do that. Um, I think about ice lavage, rotating tourniquets, some of these things you young folks would go, huh? Um, but in the day, it was considered, uh, you know, holy activities to be doing those things. So here we have cricoid pressure collapsing the airway. And 86% of men and 100% of women have difficult ventilation. 
So uh, it's just ironic how things change. Here we have cricoid pressure with and without an oral airway causing decreases in tidal volumes and an increase in peak inspiratory pressure. My belief is that the key to preventing aspiration is not pressing on the neck, but it is rather proper ventilation at low volume, low pressure, and head elevation so gravity is on your side. And we'll talk about my irid external notch, which is, I think, a key way to think about proper positioning. But uh, a wonderful article by Dan Ellis in 07 in Annals reviewed this whole cricoid pressure stuff, but it's never been validated. Aspiration occurs despite it. The imaging has kind of disproved it, and it prevents tube delivery. And it actually, in awake volunteers or in the OR before induction, if you press on the cricoid ring, it triggers vomiting which is sort of an interesting phenomenon. And then the real reason why uh, cricoid pressure, I think, will go away and we'll look back as, yeah, that was stupid, is because of its effect on the laryngeal mask airway. So the LMA is this wedge-shaped device that pops not into the larynx. It goes behind the larynx. It wedges in the upper esophagus. When you press on the cricoid ring, you actually push it out of position. And that has become our default rescue ventilation device. So I'm a fan of bimanual laryngoscopy, which is not cricoid pressure, and it is not backward, upward, rightward pressure. This is your hand and your eye connected, uh, optimizing view, pressure on the thyroid cartilage by and large. And after image, after the image is optimized, you can hand off and have an assistant. But it works through two different mechanisms. One mechanism it works through is pressure on the underlying hyoepiglottic ligament, so you improve the mechanics because basically you're driving the tip of this blade into the molecular. And it's kind of like a key fitting into a lock. If you're here and you're pressing with a lot of work and it's not lifting and then you get in this sweet spot and boom, it opens. And the same thing happens. And you guys in New York are familiar with locks. You probably all got Medicos or those, uh, those doubly sided uh, whatever. But if you're halfway into the lock and you can't turn the door, you know exactly that it just doesn't work and then boom, the last piece goes in and then the lock opens. And that's exactly how I view curved blade laryngoscopy. You have to be in that sweet spot with the tip fully advanced into the molecula so you can turn the lock, lift the other blocks. But the other reason why it works is it presses down on the thyroid and you actually are lowering the airway into the operator's line of sight. So here we have imaging with my camera just showing this <coughs> dropping down the larynx and elevating the epiglottis with a curved blade. And this is with a Goodell blade. Goodell, in case you don't know, was actually um, a fascinating guy. He had a dog whose name was Airway, and he pioneered cuff tracheal tubes. And to demonstrate the efficacy of cuff tracheal tubes, he would ketamize his poor animal and submerge him in a fish tank in front of audiences and wake him up at the end of the presentation after hooking him up to a ventilator. Um, you know, and I got a little white cotton fluff ball myself, and I think my wife and kids would kill me if I did that to Nora dog. But uh, anyway, here we have the Goodell blade, which is a straight blade. So we're lifting the epiglottis directly in these images, but we have managed to still posteriorly displace the larynx to improve laryngeal view. Under fluoro, I have some wonderful images from my friends in Canada in Halifax by George Kobach. Um, if you haven't been to Halifax, I highly recommend it. Here's the hyoid, here's the epiglottis, but watch what happens. A hand's going to come along, in this case an assistant. I would recommend you do this yourself with your right hand. But notice how mobile the larynx is, and then we're going to see a tracheal tube, the thin opaque line of the tracheal tube come down. And uh, in the words of Bill Murray, it's in the hole. Um, but there is a uh, nice fluoro image. So let's take a look at a couple of examples of bimanual laryngoscopy. And what I think many people don't appreciate is laryngoscopy, whether this is with direct or with video, is a procedure of subtlety. Minor changes in force and tip location of the blade is going to cause major difference in laryngeal exposure. So we have the edge of the epiglottis, we have the posterior cartilages and the notch. Watch the right hand, here it comes and we drop the cords down into view. We have a little bit of tongue here, but not much of a problem. In this case, which I think is true in about 10% of cases, when we let go, the larynx sort of just popped up and we lost the view. Then an assistant comes along. Now an assistant is holding it and we go for the tube. But uh, let's take another look at bimanual. 
One of the things that bimanual laryngoscopy affords is the ability to move the larynx in a side-to-side -side direction. And what that does is it lets you recognize the posterior cartilages as this vertical cleft. So we have the epiglottis, and then we're going to get a bump. And the question is, what is that bump? And Jackson talks about this, that, you know, with training, you know, you will recognize the right posterior cartilage, which is what that is, from the left. So watch, as we do our bimanual, there's a bump, bump notch, cuneiform corniculate. Here's the interarytenoid notch, that thin vertical cleft. And the tube is going underneath the epiglottis, but over the posterior cartilage into the trachea. So in the, in the most difficult airways, we're going to get an exposure of only the posterior structures, but that is our dividing line. If you go south of the interretinoid notch, you're in Jersey. If you go north, you know, across the Hudson, or not, well, east. Uh, you know, but you know what I'm saying. It's the dividing line between Manhattan and Jersey there. It's the interretinoid notch. But uh, I did this cadaver study, 1,500 laryngoscopies over a year with 100 operators. And what we found basically was when the operator manipulates the larynx themselves, that's the best way to improve laryngeal exposure. I mentioned to you already the new ACLS guidelines, which I was very happy to see. Uh, a guy at Penn by the name of Bob Newmore was very involved in these, and I've been working on Bob for a decade telling him, yeah, dump that cricoid pressure thing. And finally, there has become this abundance of evidence. And, and actually, most of the major journals have now been publishing review articles questioning the whole uh, cricoid pressure thing. So I mentioned to you Jay Silas Cohen, or Jay Solis Cohen, who was the first uh, professor of laryngology, his, uh, the English translation of the first text on lary direct laryngoscopy, which Kirsten called autoscopy, was dedicated to Dr. Cohen. And uh, he was one of five physicians in his family, uh, all of whom had connections to Jeff, actually. And after serving in uh, the Army of the Potomac, he, he was uh, in the Civil War, he wound up, um, you know, getting involved with laryngoscopy. And I like the drool bucket here on the face plates here and Kirstein doing direct. But uh, Kirstein talked about bringing the head forward so that the mouth basically came into a position that aligned with the axis of the trachea. So the body must be placed in such a position that an imaginary continuation of the laryngotracheal tube would fall within the opening of the mouth. So this gets back to the reason why people come in in respiratory distress like this. It's because your trachea is oriented in your upper thorax forward. So by bringing your head forward, you align this axis, you maximize upper airway volume. So, you know, that's thank God too, because as we age, our head comes forward. Imagine if as we aged, we went like that and we all became epistotonic, it would be terrible. We'd all basically strangle, you know, to death. Um, but uh, I came up with this concept that we should bring the head forward until the ear is aligned with the sternal notch. And I came up with that because I got frustrated with listening to people tell me, put the patient in sniffing position. And I'd go, huh, sniffing position? It's, you know, so I think our terminology is very important. I used to say optimal external laryngeal manipulation. I now say bimanual. I used to say sniffing position. I now say ear to sternal notch. But here's uh, Kirstein again. Look at how intimate a procedure laryngoscopy was back in the 1800s. Um, but uh, he talks about the forward inclination of the body and how it reduces the muscle tension in the neck. So Jackson, for those of you who don't know, perhaps the most famous physician of the 20th century, uh, came up with skull and crossbones and poison labeling and actually convinced the United States Congress on 35 trips to Washington that all caustics should be labeled and poison should be labeled. The rest of the world followed and saved millions of lives, directly responsible for training 4,000 uh, physicians. But he talked about the access to the trachea as well and, and the importance of positioning. And here's one of his drawings. Um, and again, notice the amount of head elevation. So he talked about at least 10 centimeters of head elevation. And when you go up to the OR these days, and uh, Dr. Osborne just arrived. For those of you who don't know Dr. Osborne, um, Irene is a, uh, a longtime friend of mine and an incredible resource you guys have here at Sinai. We were actually out at dinner last night discussing the fact that you should play well with your anesthesia colleagues. And thankfully, you guys are lucky to be able to do that. But I highly recommend you have an airway play date with Dr. Osborne, who has invited me to do the same. 
um, and I've enjoyed it. But uh, here's a picture of uh, Chevalier Jackson's crypt, which I visit on occasion because it's right near my house. And, uh, but his positioning, he called it the raised extended correct positioning, and the ear to sternal notch, I think if Jackson and I could have dinner, he would go for the ear to sternal notch line. But this is labeled HB, his colleague was named Herbert Boyce, and he called it the Boyce position. But what he did was, he would have this table that they would drop the, the back of the table down in the operating room, and then an assistant would grab the head and lift the head higher. And the reason why I point this out to you, um, and here's some more imaging of actually um, uh, Bannister and Macbeth in 46. So at the turn of the century, or not that much later, 1910, 1920, as positioning was getting uh, really understood by the ENT docs, along comes this nascent field of anesthesiology in the 40s and 50s, and they comment on Jackson, and here you can see they're using a straight blade. But what happened somewhere along the way was we came up with the foam donut and four centimeters of head elevation. And I don't know what that's from, but it's way inadequate. And as we have gotten bigger, um, we need to do a lot more head lift. And I mentioned to you that the reason why everybody brings their head forward is to maximize upper airway volume. So here we have, uh, I, with a tracheal tube, I walked over to radiology one day. And like this, uh, you can see my airway is somewhat obstructed. By the way, the other patients were like, you go first, doc. And I'm like, thanks. Um, but leaning my head forward, you can see this upper airway really opens. And it's no mystery why people bring their head forward, because it maximizes upper airway uh, dimensions. So I mentioned to you that somehow we got distracted with this idea of extension facilitating um, you know, airway patency and it doesn't. So here we have jaw thrust and we pop the jaw out and it really opens up. But look what happens. This is submandibular lift, but watch with just cranking the head back, the epiglottis does not come off the posterior pharyngeal wall. And in fact, with jaw distraction, bringing the face plane parallel to the ceiling, you really open up the airway. But this helps too, and on occasion I do that to assist my residents when we're bagging. But uh, this, this Atlanta occipital extension, does not open up the airway at all. So uh, my son is uh, 16 and a willing participant in my uh, airway education endeavors. I went and gave a recent grand rounds out on Long Island. He played hooky and he came up to this course with me and I got to scope him actually in front of everybody and he was totally into it. All I had to do was bribe him with a dinner at Peter Luger's on the way out and he was totally on board. Um, but uh, notice what happens with your head straight your mouth opening and your thyromental distance are minimized. And as you bring your head forward, basically, the jaw can distract significantly more. This opens up. And the reason why this is so important is because this is our displacement space. And this is true with the GlideScope, it's true with the LMA, it's true with the laryngoscope. Atlanta occipital extension is bad. You decrease space, you make it much tighter to insert these devices. And it's kind of neat that this fellow on the other side of the world a guy named Keith Greenland has now been validating this with MRI and basically um, has found that the higher you lift the head and then if you have the face plane parallel, um, that you optimize the patency of the airway. And he's done some really interesting uh, work looking at the MRI piece of this. In 1998, a fellow by the name of Steve Zeidels, who is now the chair of laryngology at Mass Eye and Ear, for those of you who watched the Oscar, well, it wasn't the Oscars, it was what, the Grammys, uh, Adele, uh, Dr. Zeidels operated on Adele, uh, but Dr. Zeidels may be the world's foremost uh, laryngologist uh, in terms of voice stuff, um, but he's up in Boston, and he gave this lecture in 98, and I heard it, and I thought, wow, that was pretty cool. What he recommended was lifting the head much higher and flexing the head on the chest to expose the larynx, and this was counter to that concept of cranking the head back. Well, so I called him up and I was able to reach him and he goes, well, come up to Boston. So I, he's, I stay at his house and in the ground floor of his back bay brownstone, he has instruments from the 1800s and early 1900s from Jackson and others. And the first case that morning was a 400 pound Massachusetts toll pike uh, collector. And this man had laryngeal polyposis. And he spoke like that and his larynx was filled with polyps 
and they waddle him into the OR. And he's this huge guy. He literally walked himself in. A huge man, kissing thighs. I mean, you know, we're talking big. Uh, a neck, uh, you know, scary. Um, and Dr. Zeidel turns to the anesthesiologist and says, you have muscle relaxants? And he goes, yes. Put the man to sleep, push the drugs. And the anesthesiologist looks at him and goes, I really don't think that's a good idea. And they have this whole debate, and it ends with the anesthesiologist saying, if you need my help, I'll be outside. And, you know, <laughs> Dr. Zeidel's attitude was, it's my larynx. Now, he, he, to be fair to Dr. Zeidel, he had already scoped this guy. He knew that what this man's larynx looked like. And, in fact, there's a fellow now at Yale, Irene and I know well, Will Rosenblatt, who believes that everybody, before they go to sleep, should have fiber optic endoscopy to assess the airway. And if you go back, actually, and look at Kirstein, look at Jackson, they all talk about if you're going to do direct laryngoscopy, you want to put a mirror in first to see, evaluate the airway. So in a way, you know, what's old is new. But in the 1900s, they recommended mirror before direct. Um, Seidel's clearly had scoped this man and knew the airway. The bottom line was they pushed the drugs, they dropped the head of the bed down, and this 400-something pound man, his fellow lifts the heads up, and he's wearing my head-mounted camera, and we see the cords come into full view, and he goes, think. And he goes, Rich, can you tell him we're about to start? I'm like, yeah. um, But it was just uh, a classic, and you know, Harvard and guys with fat heads. But uh, anyway, but Dr. Zeidels is a remarkable clinician. And so he, well, he wrote this wonderful paper on extension, 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 flexion, and what he called flexion, flexion. But I believe that face plane parallel to the ceiling is the way to go. This was a wonderful article that I only recently discovered by Kitamura, which looked at the mechanics of this. And this person subdivided the anterior obstacles to laryngeal exposure and the posterior obstacles. And what he found was the higher you lift the head, um, caudal and upward movements of mandible and tongue base increase the distance between the anterior and posterior obstacles and an increase in the submandibular space, which gets back to head forward positioning or head elevated positioning. Um, really improves laryngeal exposure. So uh, trying to sort of define, especially for the novice innovator, the best way to manage the airway from a mass ventilation perspective, Elamed, GlideScoop, Direct, I believe ear to sternal notch is the way to go. And it doesn't matter about age or size. This is a picture of my two-year-old, a large octopus. Um, by the way, she's now 15. You blink and this stuff happens, but um, large occiput here, ear to sternal notch. Every sheet and pillowcase in the place in the ER, I ramped up for this person. And, you know, this person's not comfortable breathing like this. There's tremendous advantages from positioning perspectives in terms of ramping the morbidly obese. I got involved with a group out at Stanford doing this, and this has now become standard. In fact, there is a course called Bariatric Life Support. I kid you not. Um, you know, America leading the way here in the bariatric <laughs> life support. Well, you know, the Germans and the Brits are catching up too, but, um, but bariatric life support, and they have now made ear to sternal notch alignment a, uh, a common way to optimize positioning. And, you know, it's not only about the mechanics, which, um, as I mentioned, Dr. Greenland has done some work on, it's also about, um, you know, well, there's laryngeal exposure, but there's also uh, pre oxygenation and the efficacy of pre oxygenation. But I did this study um, using angle finders, and the higher I lifted the head, basically, the more laryngeal exposure. Um, anyway, I won't go into those details, but let's keep moving here. So I got a phone call from a guy named Hubert Schmidt uh, from, uh, I forget if he was Austrian or German, but he had been combining head elevation with bimanual laryngoscopy, and well, it was really neat, you know, so we started out with 1,500 cases, wound up with 21 epiglottis only views, and then by combining these two techniques, wound up with two epiglottis only views. And, you know, what's fascinating is, like I say, there's nothing new under the sun. Chevalier Jackson, 1922, if the anterior commissure of the larynx is not readily seen, the lifting motion and elevation of the head should be increased, and if there's still difficulty, index finger externally on the neck to press the thyroid cartilage. So this is exactly what uh, I've been recommending. Chevalier Jackson was a weird guy. He had active tuberculosis. He stood about 4'11". One third of his life he had homoptosis and he would be out writing his books. Um, but he didn't believe in shaking hands because it spread disease. So he took to bowing. And in the 1920s he had this very peculiar notion that women should be physicians. 
And so he was actually one of the pioneers of MCP, Medical College of uh, Pennsylvania, that uh, promoted you know women in medicine. And he had this very strange idea that you know fascism and, and racism and sexism basically should be discarded. And that was in a time period where not many other people held those opinions. But uh, a really remarkable guy. So let's take a look at bimanual laryngoscopy with head elevation. I'm in my cadaver lab, and the bodies here have been specially prepared, venous drained, arterially flushed with isopropyl alcohol, so they're mobile. I'm demonstrating bimanual. We have corniculate cuneiform, the interretinoid notch, our posterior cartilages. We get the glottic opening, and you know the view is fine. And yes, I know where the hole is, and I can drop the tube in. But what if you want to see the anterior commissure? Well, you lift the head much higher, and uh, I'm going to do that in a second here, bring my hand around under the occiput. There's the vague hole of the esophagus. But watch what happens when we do head elevation here. Like so. <coughs> a full span of the larynx. Uh, just a little comment about tube delivery. Whenever we're aiming at the target with direct laryngoscopy, we don't want to put the tube into the line of sight. You want to go below the line of sight. I believe in what I call straight to cuff stylet shaping. So if you think about it, you know, everything that we put into narrow body cavities have this long axis that's narrow and a slightly deflected distal tip. So think about alligator forceps. It makes no sense to have a big curvy linear stylet going into a narrowing space in the upper airway. Instead, keep the long axis very narrow, have a slight deflection of the distal tip, and you can see it come up from below, from below the line of sight. And the other piece to remember is the dental arch is like this, so our maneuverability is in the right corner of the mouth, or the squishy corner of the mouth. You see the tube tip come up over the interretinoid notch, that dividing line between trachea anteriorly and esophagus posteriorly. So breaking down laryngoscopy, how are we doing on time? Okay, great. Um, breaking down laryngoscopy, um, I no longer consider this a procedure of like 40 steps. I don't do intubation. I do epiglottoscopy, laryngeal exposure, or laryngoscopy, and then tube delivery. And I think we should think about that for video laryngoscopy as well. We're not simply putting a tube in. And the way to make this procedure of the airway reliable so that you're not having that heart pounding, am I going to get it kind of feeling, is you're aiming for the epiglottis. So in fact, prior to the drugs going in, I envision the epiglottis. I see it in my mind's eye. Um, but I, all I want to do is distract the jaw, dab the posterior pharynx, where's the epiglottis? And I go, ah, epiglottis. Okay, let's work now on laryngeal exposure and then work on tube delivery. But this is a low force thing because all you're doing is that three pounds of tissue. Um, but if you crank the head back, you will make epiglottoscopy harder because what will happen is basically you push it like that. So by bringing the head forward, you actually promote epiglottoscopy. And then laryngeal exposure, you want to control the tongue. It's fascinating actually, and I only recently discovered that the German school of laryngoscopy, Brunings, Killian, Kirstein, that group took a turn from Chevalier Jackson about 1915. So they actually recommended a midline approach to expose the epiglottis. Then Jackson, focusing more on the tube delivery piece of it, said come from the right and bring the tip of the laryngoscope to midline. And since then we have gotten into this teaching mode where we go like this. We teach people to basically crank the laryngoscope all the way to right, go in and sweep. The problem with that is, if you don't find the epiglottis, you're poking around in pink mush and you're lost. So I actually follow the curve of the curve blade down, find the epiglottis, and then with direct, I worry about tongue control. And because I'm using low force, I can move the blade over. Now, it's interesting with the glide scope and some of the other video laryngoscopes, midline is recommended. And that's a beautiful thing because it's easier to find the epiglottis when you go midline. Just don't go too deep. That's the error that people make with the standard four glide scope, is you just plunge, lift, don't see what you're looking for. It's pink mush everywhere. And so if you back out, find the epiglottis. I think that's a key with video as well as with direct. But bimanual and head elevation are a greater force involved. And then tube delivery is a separate piece of the puzzle.
So uh, let's take a look at some of the glide scope issues. Um, I think, uh, and video learning scopes, suction epiglottoscopy as important for video as it is for direct, lifting the tongue and jaw because you need space for tube delivery, and I'll show you some videos how what I mean by that. And then by tilting the optics away from the target, you actually make it easier to deliver the tube. So uh, I'll show you with an image what this means, but basically, if you take your curved blade of the glide scope and you crank it in like this, and your image gets beautiful, the problem is that your approach angle steepens and then your trachea is going like that. So you actually make it harder to intubate. And what I call two-stage delivery, whenever we're working off of a video monitor, the first thing you need to do is bring the tube into view and then see where you are and then adjust where you're going. So you don't want to go with the tube and pop it in. You want to introduce it till it comes into view and you introduce it under vision, direct vision, you see the tip and then you make a minor adjustment. So uh, let's take a look at some cases here. And this is the how not to do it school of glide scope intubation. So notice where the target is. The target is beautiful. I mean, we have a full view. The epiglottis is huge coming way up here, okay? Here we have our posterior cartilages, our aryepiglottic fold. This is, again is our PE or pharyngoepiglottic fold but we have put the target at the center and southern hemisphere of the screen. We don't want that. When it comes to the glide scope, you want to be in the northern half of the screen. And the reason is you need delivery space. You need to see where the tube is coming from. Remember, this procedure is not about exposing the larynx, although that's a beautiful thing, and I love looking at larynx. The procedure is about dropping the tube into the target. And so what happens here is we're going to get, you know, past the tongue, and then we're going to be way in. And we get the epiglottis, and there's our larynx, but we are so far in like this that what happens is our delivery space is very small. So here's the posterior larynx. Where's the tube? It's poking around in this small space between the posterior larynx, and you don't even see it on the screen. So, you know, it's one of the most frustrating things in the world. You have a beautiful view of the target, and you can't drop the tube. Uh, and what you need to do is back out uh, so that you give yourself more delivery space. And in the heat of battle, you know, when, and finally they, they are lucky enough to drop it in, but it takes 55 seconds to uh, expose the target and drop the tube in. <laughs> so let's take a look at what I would consider an excellent glide scope technique. Uh, this video I call rice and beans for obvious reasons. But, um, <laughs> so first we have the uvula. Then we get the posterior pharynx, and this is a beautiful thing. We have the tongue here, but watch what happens next, the yank hour. So, you know, this is exactly what I would recommend, that you go down very gently, you see the epiglottis, look at where they're keeping the target. The target is in the northern half of the screen. Epiglottis, there's a lot of foreign body here, but they have kept this space, which allowed for quick identification of the tube, and then a minor adjustment to uh, drop the tube in. Um, this is actually a remarkable video that I was only recently given by a crazy short guy by the name of Marvin Wayne. For those of you who don't know Marvin, Marvin uh, was a Vietnam era surgeon who became an emergency doc. But this was a fatal case developed over 12 hours in a young man of epiglottitis. And look at that epiglottis. So the epiglottis has this omega shape like this, it's beefy red. They could not succeed in intubating this person from above. Now, what would an ENT surgeon, they pass a tube, it goes in the wrong hole. Why does it go in the wrong hole? Because they have this curved stylet and a slight twirl of the right and the stylet goes off to the right and they don't even get it. They, don't, they can't see beyond the epiglottis edge. So then they go back in and CPR is in progress, by the way, but look at this epiglottis. It's, it's like that. But, you know, unfortunately, you need either fiber optics here or a straight blade to get inside the laryngeal introitus to really expose the target. Now, what would an ENT doc do? An ENT doc would recognize that beefy epiglottis for what it is. The interesting thing about, you know, the epiglottis is it's the only horizontal structure that you come across as you come down. And so you see this beefy red thing, but it's going this direction. That's got to be the epiglottis. And then they would basically go in with a D-discope or a 
some other, um, you know, direct and open this up a straight blade and drop the tube in. Um, but this uh, person died, was uh, 20 something years old, developed this epiglottitis over 12 to 16 hours and came in basically in uh, cardiac arrest. So I wrote an article this past year on uh, imaging devices and the complexities of intubation. And like I said, there is exposing the larynx, getting the tube from here to there, and then going down into the trachea and be cognizant of the fact that the trachea is, is directing itself posteriorly into the thorax. So um, let's see. Um, I, I managed to uh, send an email to a guy I hadn't met, this crazy, enthusiastic critical care guy named Scott Weingart. And um, the next thing you know, we got involved in this paper. And I only met him for the first time last night uh, in person. <laughs> at a very nice Italian place that Dr. Jagoda took us to. But uh, there's a guy passionate about airway stuff. There aren't that many of us in the world, and Scott I would put high on the list. Um, but we wrote this article about risk gratification and you know the best way to oxygenate. And what I find interesting about the pulse ox curve, and I would consider people who are between you know, uh, 91 or 90 and uh, you know, 90 and 95, I would consider them high risk. And the reason why they're high risk for desaturation is because you don't know on the pulse ox curve, are you back here where you had a little space before that you fall off the cliff, or are you very close? Now, obviously, there are the critically ill who are hypoxic to start. And in that subgroup, peak valve is very important, positive pressure ventilation, oxygenation throughout the whole procedure, during induction, during onset phase. And then we want to run nasal oxygen during apnea. But this group, I think, is the trickiest. Somebody who comes in, you think they have multilobar pneumonia, let's say they're tachycardic or septic, they're high metabolic needs. On a non rebreather they're at 92, 93, 94. And then you have a little delay dropping the tube in, and these people can precipitously desaturate. But now with nasal oxygen, my experience is uh, you can do very well. Now, who does um, apneic oxygenation fail in? Who do you think does poorly with apneic oxygenation? So I'm a fan of throwing nasal cannula on everybody, but when they have vomit filling their airway, that's bad. Um, and uh, so people with tons of fluids in their upper airway, it's hard to passively oxygenate. The morbidly obese, you know, they get this right to left shunt because they basically collapse half their lung volume if they're flat. That's why we are meant to breathe vertically. You know, it's a really interesting thing that we have historically taken sick people, have them lay them flat, and then we've induced drugs. Uh, you really want head elevation. And I mentioned to you the peep valve. So I now run nasal cannula, and then in some people, I'm putting in a nasal trumpet. I gently induce, uh, or after induction, I will gently ventilate those who need positive pressure with a peep valve. And it's important to note that if you just hold this bag mask over their face and not squeeze it, they will entrain room air. So you don't get optimal oxygenation. But low volumes, low rates, and head elevation, I think, is critical. Dr. Weingart, I think, would suggest uh, you know, CPAP, and I have done that as well. Um, but the fascinating thing about this whole apneic diffusion oxygenation, and you guys may have already gotten this lecture from him, but I used to believe that movement of the diaphragm was connected to oxygen absorption. And what I've discovered is they actually have really not that much of a direct relationship. What happens during apnea is CO2 comes out very slowly, only 10 milliliters a minute, but oxygen can go into the lungs at 250. And the net result is that you have this subatmospheric pressure. So when we push drugs, if you were to put your head up to the, the patient's mouth, what you would hear is, not really, you won't hear that, but functionally that's what's happening. And these wonderful studies that come from the 50s, they rendered these people apneic using pabulon for apnea that extended to 53, 55 minutes. Look at the lowest arterial saturation. Now, these were, quote, Navy volunteers. Um, but, uh, you, know, you know, now look what happened to their CO2. So their CO2 goes through the roof. One person went up to 250. 250, that's an impressive CO2. Uh, their pH obviously starts to fall dramatically. So you need to ventilate to blow off CO2, but to absorb oxygen, you don't need to ventilate. You just need to put oxygen on. 
So how crazy was it that basically my whole career, I have been rendering people apneic with muscle relaxants, taking oxygen off at the most critical and vulnerable part of the procedure. Kind of nuts. Um, here's another paper, which or another study, which showed PaO2s with supplemental oxygen during apnea maintaining themselves in the 400 range during apnea, whereas if you connect the two to air when they stop breathing, look what happens, they fall precipitously. So Teller, among the first people to start using low flow nasal oxygen, 10 minutes of safe apnea after muscle relaxants compared to the same patient who was pre-oxygenated optimally but without nasal cannula only had six minutes. So uh, I'm into sticky ideas and I came across this uh, acronym. I was in my hot tub one day and I'm wrestling with the nasal oxygen, one of the benefits of moving out of New York. And don't get me wrong, I really miss Papaya King. You know, I can't tell you enough about how much I love Papaya King. When, I, when my mom was sick in the hospital here, I would make regular runs over to Papaya King on 86th and 3rd and bring it back to the Onk unit uh, for the entire unit. Um, but uh, there's many things about New York I love. but. Uh, Having a hot tub and looking at the stars at night, that's a nice thing. So what I was thinking, in you know, nasal oxygen, securing the tube, and it hit me. No VSAT, nasal oxygen during efforts securing the tube. Uh, so now I run nasal oxygen on everybody. And um, let me just show you here. This is a wonderful, my favorite video of 2011. squeezing the bag, and the patient's sitting there, bing, 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 the pulse looks beautiful. Um, so with that, I'm going to end here with a picture of uh, Lake George. Thank you very much for having me. I'd be happy to take the question. What do you think about the new trends in video laryngoscopes uh, going back to the 60 degree angle to showing us what we probably should be seeing with the, uh, with the uh, Macintosh blade? Thank you for that, Irene. Um, there was a pregnant pause there. Which was, um, so uh, what Dr. Osborne is asking, you know, that obviously the GlideScope, which now occupies about 95% of the video laryngoscope market, um, you know, you get these great views, but sometimes you have two delivery issues. And the problem becomes if you immerse a GlideScope into fluids, or if you have blood secretions in trauma situations particularly, um, on occasion, you can get into real trouble because once you obscure your view, you're done. Now, if you think about um, car safety, you know, I will drive home today, I, I just got a new truck. It's actually a used truck, but it's a Toyota Tacoma. Um, it's a great truck. Anyway, but I will stay off my phone, so I drive carefully, you know, unlike many people I see. I try to stay off my phone. I made a pact with my teenagers. Number two, I have a seatbelt. Number three, I have front side curtain airbags. In fact, I think there's an airbag now. I was on a plane the other day, there was airbags built into the bulkhead seat restraints. Um, but think about how all those things work. They work in tandem. It's not in series. In other words, you crash your car, hopefully you don't crash your car, but if you crash your car, the seatbelt tightens, the airbags go off, all at the same time. If you think about video laryngoscopes, hyperangulated curve plate, if you fail, how do you rescue GlideScope innovation? About half the time, it's rescued with direct, which is kind of like, huh? Like, you know, whereas if you take a video laryngoscope and you actually merge a low profile, and I think that's the key point, a low profile curved blade, like the English or German design Max, and then you put video where the light source is, you have a video laryngoscope, and if you lose your monitor, it doesn't power up, the thing's obscured, you still have a direct view with a brilliant light. So, particularly in the bloody, vomit-filled emergency airway, I am partial to 
video learning scope that merges with direct because I think it gives you more of that redundant in tandem approach to it. Um, and the you know the key points are still the same: epiglottoscopy, suctioning, fine, you know, and then. Um, the other piece about this is once you take a curve blade like that and you expose the target, whether on video or, or only on video or through direct, you have the back end of the blade for delivering the tube, so tube delivery is a ton simpler. Now, in the worst anterior, so to speak, and I think that's a bit of a myth what that means, anterior, but in the worst airway, let's say you have somebody who's fixed flexion like that and you're trying to image him. I think there are cases where the hyperangulated blades have advantages over the combined video and direct because they just get around the curve better. But I think that that number is so tiny and what we give up instead going to the hyperangulated blade is we introduce an element of difficulty with tube delivery. And the glide scope takes longer. So uh, roughly 10, 15 seconds longer than direct. Um, so I don't know, I think there's pluses and minuses to everything. Glidescope has the installed base out there. They now have the direct trainer, but I don't really like that blade because it's too big a flange. Um, but I don't know, I'd be curious to know what your thoughts are, Aaron. Thanks, no, I, I, I'm beginning to appreciate those quite a bit. Um, graph matches, I mean, we had the Glidescope trainer for a lot of years, it was great, and we used the Prinoza with this a little too uh, large, especially in terms of introduction, but it, it's amazing how uh, how infrequently we need the 60 degree angle. You know, it's, it, was, it was beautiful to have a exposure and, and to see the time, the kind of anatomy that we were missing. But I, I think video makes us better for gossipists. And, and I think there's something to be said for having two ways to do a mission critical task. It, you know, I mean, it, I, I worry about whether or not the youngins only know how to do video. And then if the video doesn't work, they're going to they're not be able to tube somebody. Uh, and then, you know, as that epiglottitis case shows you, if you're above the epiglottis and you're having tube delivery issues, you're hosed. I mean, if your imaging is here and you can't lift up the epiglottis direct and you can't get underneath it, uh, you're in trouble. And, you know, I, as great as the scope is, and I think it has made airway management accessible to many people with very poor laryngoscopy skills. Um, I don't think it, uh, well, but I don't think it necessarily, you know, the overall success rates of Glidescope innovation, 98 plus percent. You look at direct in the hands of a skilled person, it's probably 99. But I just think that having two ways to do mission critical things is a good system. Whether you look at aviation, whether you look at skydiving, whether you look at any mission critical thing where death is going to occur if you have equipment failure, you want your devices to be in tandem, deployable at the same time. Should one work, you have your backup. And with a hyperangulated blade, you go in, if you have a problem, you have to come out and then go to some other rescue device. And it may be, who knows, I mean, we have yet really to nail how an LMA merges with intubation. So, you know, we play with all these devices, and I've done a lot in the lab lately, where we take LMAs and we're trying to intubate through them. And, but it's not so easy. But perhaps, I mean, and this is just speaking, you know, in an ideal sense, the best way to actually manage the airway would probably be to drop in the ventilation device that while you're ventilating, you could image the intubation. And if we ever figure out how to do that well, I think that's a powerful combination. Because right now we still focus maybe too much on viewing and the plastic instead of the oxygen and the ventilation. My two cents. Other questions? Um, I guess I'm just like, taking off on something you just said. Right now, our strategy for training our residents is to have them do direct the first two years before they can use the live scope, just to get them proficient a little bit. Not that I was wondering if you had any thoughts on an optimal way to make sure that they get good at everything. Well, you know, so Irene said that, and I agree with her, that the, um, you know, what video does is it allows you to see the larynx and see the anatomy. I think we've historically done a poor job of educating the residents about the original anatomy. I actually now take all of my trainees and in their intern week, we have six fiber optic scopes with sheaths. I don't know are you guys using these or not, but we have these sheaths that fit over our, so long Aaron, 
we, we have these sheets that fit over our rhino laryngoscopes. And so I run airway workshops now where we have six scopes, six stations projected on the wall and the residents all scope themselves and each other with these scopes and then they take the sheets off and then they you know switch. But I think the best way for an emergency physician to learn the airway is to have them go to anesthesia in the morning, have them go to EMT in the afternoon, to teach them fiber optics aggressively at an early point. And it's not that they're going to need fiber optic skills a lot in the ER, although it's incredibly reassuring to be able to scope somebody with Ludwig's and go, yeah, their airway's okay, I can get the CAT scan, you can get on the phone with EMT. You know, having the, taking away the voodoo of fiber optics is a huge advantage, but what it does is it teaches you airway anatomy like nothing else. So I'm not sure if you guys have an EMT rotation. It, it, the best way to dramatically boost your airway education and understanding is to send them to ENT clinic, where every afternoon there's 40 or 50 fiber optic uh, assessments. And so now it's become like, you know, not a big deal. It used to be, oh yeah, we have to call ENT to scope people. And now my residents pick up a sheet and they scope the patient, and if necessary, they get on the horn with somebody. But I think that that teaching airway anatomy that way is great. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of toys. I think we have to be careful that we only that we don't teach them just to one toy. Uh, were they able to secure an airway on that epiglottitis feature? They no, to... they cut the neck. Um, which, speaking from a training perspective, in the days of the Giants, we used to do all the time. When I started at Bellevue, one third of the airways were surgical because back in the day, we thought. If somebody had a collar, you had to ram a tube in their nose or cut the neck. It was unacceptable to do oral intubation in the mid '80s, um, but it became, you know, obviously the standard. But uh, you know, the surgical airway I think still remains an educational challenge and an infrequently performed skill. Um, but there's a guy who has issues because you can't mask that patient well. You can't tell a man. King LT isn't going to work. And then you have imaging up here with the glide scope that is above the epiglottis. So it's the trifecta of badness. And when you get that, when you see that coming, so you have angioedema, you have burns, you have some of these other situations, there is no rescue ventilator, you know? And that's a very important thing in your brain to trip and realize, ah, gotta go to surgical early. I would throw oxygen on them, you know, aggressively try to ventilate as you can, but really the surgical airway has to move up immediately. And unfortunately with video, you tend to persist. And so, uh, but yeah, no, I, I have autopsy pictures of what his whole airway looked like, and it's amazing. Do you have any comments on the best cricothoracic technique? There's like three or four that are described, and everyone's got a strong opinion. What's your strong opinion? <laughs> um, so I think you should keep it simple. I think you should take a knife, get into the trachea. I'm not a fan of um, I'm not a fan of the wire guided milker. I think it's really not very useful. In the patients whose landmarks are evident, I would just do a single horizontal incision uh, through skin and membrane. In patients whose landmarks aren't evident, you know, vertical midline, palpate, and open it up. But uh, I think we're going to see, and I know this because I've been working on a few of them, some new devices that are going to um, work differently. But what I find fascinating is like the US military has the greatest challenge in this. Um, in the Iraq Afghanistan theater, in the last, I think it's five years, they had 100 surgical airways. And um, their approach to the airway is, if you can have laryngoscopy in the field done without response, you're dead. Um, so they don't do it. They put people either face down, or they sometimes they drop in kings for transport between facilities. But in the face blasted head injury, they go right to surgical. So they have to train eight to 10,000 medics a year, how to do surgical airways. These are 18 to 20 year olds who have no past medical training. And uh, their approach is access the trachea, and they use a bougie to assist with it, uh, and a 602. But I, I think keeping it simple is important. I think that the error most people make is they start too late. They start on dead people, and they wind up with dead people. When you're putting the angle on the distal end of the to facilitate that anterior motion. Do you have a uniform way that you do that? How'd you guess? Um, so, uh, yeah, so the uh, a bougie, which by the way is not a heat-seeking missile, 
um, doesn't magically, magnetically go into the trachea. I've seen ER docs. I couldn't see anything, so I picked up a bougie. You know, like, <laughs> if you couldn't see anything, don't throw a bougie in there. The odds that you're going to get it in the trachea is slim to none. Um, you know, I only use the bougie, well, actually, I've it for 10 years, and I've never used it in anger, because now I use an optical side lead if I really need something. But, um, so the bougie has a straight distal tip, I mean, straight shape, and then the distal tip comes up at 38 degrees. And it's interesting to note that the bougie was actually first developed in 1949 by Sir Robert McIntosh, the same guy who gave us the Mac blade. But he said that one of the obstacles to intubation is that as I place the tube, the back end of the tube blocks the line of sight to the target. So he understood that that curvy linear big piece of plastic was not easily seen. And they were using rubber argyle tubes then, but it wasn't easily seen, the target. So then, on this side of the Atlantic, we got into stylets. On that side of the Atlantic, they started using bougies. So in the UK, if you were to rotate there, people would look at you like you had, you know, you were crazy if you were intubating without a bougie because they don't use any stylet. But uh, I think the shape should be straight to cuff and 35 degrees, which is a very low bend angle compared to what most people. If you crank it up and you go, oh, it's an interior where I want a really steep angle. You know, what people don't appreciate is that the, um, you know, the trachea is, is uh, average dimension is 16 to 22 millimeters in males and uh, 14 to 16 in females or something like that. So what we're talking about is a tube that's this big. So if you take the bend angle to extreme, which is what some people do, basically you catch the rings and it won't go down. And the glide right stylet with its big angle, it's okay for getting up to the cords, but then you have to stop, pop, and drop the tube in because you can't get that in. So I, I think there's a lot of subtlety to tube delivery, but that's a separate lecture and I think I'm running over. But Do you have any uh, thoughts on the utility of retrograding? Yeah, I, you know, I've been teaching it for the last decade in my course, and recently we bagged it. And the reason is that... What was the question? About retrograde, you know, the utility of retrograde intubation. I, I think, you know, so the only potential use of retrograde I can imagine is if you have somebody who's not skilled in fiber optics, um, somebody who you're trying to avoid cutting the neck, and you're trying to pass a tube, but they're not hypoxic and you have all the time in the world. But if that's the case, you could play with your video ringoscopes, you could do other things, you could drop an LMA. You know, the LMA is a mucus-free highway to the larynx. Um, it's a beautiful thing. And if you're good with a long scope and an LMA, uh, you know, it, it's no wonder why anesthesia does that. Think about this, you know, the airway fails, you call down somebody, who do you get? You get ENT, who in one hand has a scalpel, in the other hand they have fiber optics. You get anesthesia, in one hand they have an LMA, in the other hand they have fiber optics. And, but the LMA fiber optic thing is a very powerful uh, technique, but I, I'm not that much of a fan of retrograde. What I find is it's remarkable how often it is difficult to aspirate air, the skin plug gets sucked into the needle, the wire sometimes doesn't uh, go as planned, and even when you're in the cricothyroid membrane, you're only a half inch below the cords. So after the wire comes down and then the stiffener comes down, there's a tremendous subtlety to dropping the tube. Um, so uh, the long answer is, I think, retrograde. Uh, I no longer recommend that we stop it in our ER. Um, but has anybody done one recently? I, I actually had one, but it was the case you described. Somebody that had a head bleed, their anatomy was such that we were having a difficult time intubating, but we could ventilate and oxygen, and no problem. But could you see the epiglottis? We could. This was probably a glide scope, and we got an anesthesia down. They brought a glide scope down and spent 20 minutes trying to negotiate really? the and they couldn't do it. So we ended up doing the retrograde and went in, but it's still only time. Yeah, see, and I would argue the guy has a head bleed. Cut his neck. Just do it slowly with oxygen applied. Like, he's headed to a surgical <laughs> anyway. Why, why do you delay? I mean, you know, really. No, but I mean, like, there are cases where, I mean, I can show you a couple of what I call the surgically inevitable. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that the, um, here, let me just uh, show you one or two of these. But the, uh, you know, there are, you know, these surgically inevitable cases. And I, I think it's a matter of conceptualizing the issue. Now, you could, 
obviously you can rescue ventilate this person or you were oxygenating just fine and that's very important because if you couldn't um, you know it would be a bad thing but like here is uh, let me just show you one of these here um, this is uh, a case that a friend of mine at Penn at Dickinson gave me so um, this person is stabbed in the face and here is the corner of the mouth cut by the knife punctures the tongue and the tongue is now a rock hard expanding hematoma and as they went in with the first video laryngoscope uh, basically the tongue went <laughs> and they quickly realized this and went to the surgical airway but I think that the challenge for most of the time in the surgical airway is that you lose the ability to rescue ventilate you lose LMA, King LT and mass ventilation and once you see that coming you better get cut like hopefully earlier than later. But I think that well, the example you described is one of those scenarios where you have the time, you haven't been able to get anything else to work right. Um, did they try an LMA or? Yeah. So I, I don't know, but I think nowadays, you know, if you, you put in an LMA and you get a long fiber optic, you know, it, it's really phenomenal how well that can work in the right hands. Um, but, you know, if the retro